All right. Welcome again, everyone. Welcome to Irrigation Orientation. My name is Yiling Zhang. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in Central District. So welcome to this uh, webinar series. It is uh, an eight week long webinar series. Uh, the first week we gave an overview of the Florida water, uh, why water resources of protection is, such impo is so important in Florida. And the last week we covered uh, some basics of irrigation, including how to let your plants to tell you when to water. And today we will move to a very interesting topic. That's the question actually we usually get a lot. It's like, what's wrong with my yard? And today's guest speaker is Miss Lisa Sanderson. She is the residential horticulture agent and the master, master gardener coordinator in Sumter County. Now let's welcome Miss Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am uh, very excited to be here today. So a lot of these questions are, or the a lot of things that I talk about are things that I talk about regularly. And so I have actually the Q&A is open and I know that um, it's gonna be watched, but I will keep an eye on it too uh, as I move along. And so hopefully if there are any questions that come up that are pertinent to what I'm talking about at the time, I'll be able to answer those. So the, the thing that I want to share with you is so much stuff is coming up. And so you've, I am the third one here on July 15th. And so you have all sorts of really great talks still coming. So the reclaimed water do's and don'ts. So important. Uh, how do I maintain my zoysia and the St. Augustine? So warm season turf has, is like a character all of its own. So, uh, you know, learning about how to manage those is really important. If there's micro, -irrig micro irrigation that you're interested in learning about, this would be a great talk right here. And I think the last one, I think she said Hannah Wooten's doing this one. This is a great thing. And so I have a lot of new residents. I'm The, the villages is in my uh, area. And some of those new residents get pummeled with landscapers trying to earn their business. And so I think it's good to know ahead of time what to expect and what kind of questions to ask and how you evaluate those folks that are going to come and serve you in your lawn. So these are really great. And so I would um, see how many of those you can attend. All right, so I have this picture of this lovely lawn right here, which is usually the question I end up getting. And um, like she said, what's wrong with my yard? And so we get lots of those. And so I really wanna talk a bit about uh, some of this. And so usually this is a much longer presentation because there's more things involved. And so, we talk about the stressful life of turf and it is a stressful life. So many of you may have come from Northern states where you had tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass and most people never have any trouble with those things other than a few little issues here and there, but you get down to this warm season turf and it seems like the management of it can just be sometimes a bit daunting. And so there's so many things to consider and so many things that you think could be going wrong with it. So I actually have highlighted in blue the things that I think are usually the first things I think people should look for. What uh, if your lawn is experiencing drought? And I actually have someone who I've talked to just recently that does not irrigate as often, even the, in the throes of summer. And so sometimes has some drought issues can come from overwatering, And sometimes those recommendations come to them from landscapers on how much they should be watering. So we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about uh, watering and how often. And so a lot of times I ask, the question comes to me, how much should I water? So we're gonna talk a bit about that. And then I'm gonna also share the season of watering. So a lot of the landscape issues I try to attribute to a holiday um, and so February 14th and April 1st, and so all these other things that I come up with, but I think that there's a season of watering and I don't really have holidays that go with those, but hopefully the calendar that I show you will help you um, based on where you may be. And then also I cover a lot of inspecting your irrigation system because a lot of times people start immediately looking for disease and fungus, which is the stuff I have down here with biotic stresses, and actually it has a lot more to do with things I have highlighted in blue. So you could have shade issues or nutrient deficiency and over fertilization issues, which can also lead to thatch along with overwatering. 
but then you also have traffic and uh, like, for example, zoysia versus St. Augustine grass and cold temperatures and how they affect it. So all these things like scalping and fertility and uh, aerating, all these things also contribute. But the big ones to me are the irrigation. I think that's really important to consider what could be going on with the irrigation system. And I usually recommend people start there first, because if you're not observing the other things specifically, or it's not the season for a certain fungus, it's better to look at other reasons why. And I think it, water often can be the problem. All right, so some people get bills that have both their outside and their inside irrigation on one bill. And so it could be really daunting to try and figure out, well, exactly, have I done way too much laundry? Is that why my bill's gone up? Or am I watering too much? Uh, and so that can be one of those things and can be very hard for those folks that do not have that broken down on their bills. So we have, we're like that in the villages, part of the villages gets this kind of bill and the other one, I'm sure you probably can see my um, thing, the other part of the villages, the newer parts of the villages have a separate bill and they actually have reclaimed water. So you're going to hear a little bit more about reclaimed water um, from other folks, but um, that separate bill allows them to see how much they're spending on their water outside. And then also will help them to identify leaks, um, identify how much they're watering. And so being able to see the seasonal differences of water, how much it's costing them uh, and allowing them to make those adjustments, which I think is a nice thing. Um, and then the potable water is the inside and the garden hose bibs. And so sometimes people talk about wanting to eat outside, you know, grow edibles. It can be a problem when you're having that reclaimed water. All right. So the big one I have is how do you know when to water? And so this is, you know, people um, automatically, they get into a rhythm where they're watering two times a week. I had folks that did it throughout the year, two times a week. And so we'll talk a bit about that. But um, you really want to water lawns when it is, uh, the lawn indicates that. And if you were on, I guess it's last week's talk, uh, that is one of those things that it tells you when your lawn needs to be watered. And so you'll see the, the grass blades right here have folded. Your overall cast of your lawn may change just slightly. You don't wait for it to go completely dry, uh, but you're going to look for that slight change in cast and check your blades. Eventually you get really good at identifying this uh, and you'll, you'll know when it's time based on what the color of the lawn looks like that, oh yeah, my next time I'm going to turn the irrigation on. So some people have specific days they have to water. Um, and then the other thing you may find is that a lot of times people will walk through their lawns and they don't pay any attention to footprints. They just walk through their lawn. It's no big deal. But you can tell when your lawn is at that point that it needs to be watered because your footprints will stay. And so if that happens, that's going to let you know that you need to irrigate. So why is this so important? Why do you want to look for folded blades of grass and footprints in your lawn? You really want to look for um, that to be something that uh, allows you to manage um, your lawn success. You want to create an opportunity for those uh, that your lawn to grow those um, longer roots. You really want to have those established longer roots. And the reason this is important because is if you have any kind of uh, watering restrictions put in place, if you have those longer roots, your lawn is going to be more resilient. It's going to hold up a little bit better. It may not last forever but it's gonna do better than maybe someone who's just automatically watering two days a week, or as some landscapers are saying, watering three days a week and they end up with these little short roots. So you really wanna create that opportunity for longer roots. And so that's why you do that. You know, the other thing is, is that you wanna know how long should you water? And that's always the big question is that uh, I have people call me here at the office because I answer a lot of long questions. Well, how long should I water my lawn? Well, it has so many things. And so this is the traditional uh, extension agent answer. Well, it depends. So if you're looking at uh, these things, so uh, the villages has hunter, everything is hunter. So you've got a hunter rotor, which is a something that runs uh, maybe up to an hour sometimes. And then you've got the rotator, which I'll show you that in a little bit, um, but that they do a little bit different things. You have pop-ups, which may run 15 to 20 minutes, depending on where you have them. 
impact sprinklers are things, well, I, this is on the list. The impact sprinkler is something that you really don't use in a residential uh, setting. A lot of times you'll see these if you're driving by nurseries, they may have uh, tall sprays on spikes, but sometimes they're using impact sprinklers depending on where they are. So these are those ones that kind of uh, bounce back and forth and um, shoot water out. So I think you probably know what those are. And then there's also different makers. And so while I haven't listed Hunter here, there's Rainbird and Toro Orbit. Uh, and KB, and so there's different makers, and they may also have different settings based on what their heads are. And so the theory here is, is that you do not want to mix, um, you, because there's different times for each head, you do not want to mix them. Uh, and the, there's several reasons for that. And we'll talk, we'll see a, a little image of that in just a little bit. But the thought here is that you you really want to have all of the same type of, of head and on the same zone. So you do not want to have more than one type of head uh, within a zone. So, because when you do that, it kind of messes things up and we'll show that a little bit later. The other thing you want to do is that um, I think um, this has also been called the catch can test. I really like the word calibrate because when I uh, tell people how to do this, I want them to be able to calibrate their lawn once every year. And so I'll, I'll show you how to do that. And the reason that we wanna do that, ideally, you're not watering the tops of the plants, you're watering the roots. And so when your irrigation's coming on while your grass blades will end up wet, ultimately you're trying to fill those pore spaces in your soil where your roots are located. Uh, and so you want to deliver half an inch to three quarters of an inch of water. So if you were um, doing this and you end up delivering less than half an inch of water, you're not giving the optimum amount of water for your lawn's roots. So you'll need to increase the amount of time that the irrigation goes off. So you can kind of squeeze into here somewhere between the half an inch and three quarters. Uh, but however, if you end up watering an inch of water and you're doing that two times a week, that means your lawn is getting two inches of water. So you really want to turn this down uh, so that you are um, not watering an inch, but you're getting down back into this range of half an inch to three quarters of an inch, which is optimum for the roots of your warm season turf. That's really what you want to achieve so that you can inspire those longer roots. Um, and that would be for each irrigation event. So when I talk about um, irrigating and I change things up for the season, you're still gonna do the half an inch to three quarters of an inch when it's time to water. Uh, and the reason this is important, if you have watering restrictions, again, you wanna have the longer roots. Okay, so here we go. I still eat my tuna out of cans. I love tuna. My cat loves tuna. <laughs> So I save cans so that, you know, I can make demonstrations if I have to with a can. You can go through with a Sharpie and mark your half inch and three quarters of an inch mark on the inside of your cans. But some people don't want to mess with those. You may have dog food cans, chicken or uh, cat food cans, but you want to have a flat, um, a container that has flat or straight up edges. You don't want it to be, to be fanned. You want it to be just straight up. Uh, they do make these little mini rain gauges. They're bright yellow, at least the ones I've seen that have a, a little spike and you can do the same thing. And so depending on your zone, there are eight of these cans right here. You may do eight to 10 cans spread out within a zone, one zone at a time. And then you will, uh, if you pay attention to what University of Florida says, it says, run it during the day, run it for a little while, do some math. <laughs> And I'm like, well, I don't really want to do math. I just want to make sure I'm watering enough. So I tell people just do this and run your irrigation the night that night that you're supposed to run. And you would do this for each zone one time a year. And that way you can do your tweaking to make sure that you're delivering that half inch to three quarters of an inch. And so after you're done running the irrigation here, you'd move to the next one and the next one uh, until you get through all of your lawn areas to make sure that things are uh, what they're supposed to be. So let's say you have a can that has nothing in it. 
all the other cans have something and you got a can that doesn't have anything. You may find out that you have an issue with that head. That means that you might want to check that head and make sure it's okay. You might want to turn your irrigation on during the day to see if that head is actually uh, uh, spraying in the direction it's supposed to, because it might be spraying in a different direction, which you'll see a little bit later. So you want to make sure that you calibrate one time a year with whatever you do, whether it's tuna or those lovely little spikes. All right. So the other thing is how often should you water? And so I said, uh, irrigate up to two times a week during the growing season. And we'll talk about a little bit more about this. So this image here, this image that I also put, had on my, um, my title page is a picture of a lawn and uh, part of that lawn is over on the right. And so the theory here is that you don't want to overdo it. Well, apparently um, this person had been told to water um, their lawn two times a day. So all that regular irrigation water that you might do two times a week, they were doing two times a day and in two months their lawn was dead. So you want to make sure that I think as homeowners that you are not afraid to question uh, instructions that have been given to you that do not seem logical. And so, uh, and don't be afraid to ask questions. And so I'm sure Hannah will talk about that because to me, this is really important. This is your lawn uh, that you're paying for. Uh, this is your water that you're having to pay for. So I had one lady who watered her lawn five times a week because the landscaper told her to, and she also killed her lawn. Uh, and so then she was going to one who's going to have to bear the brunt of replacing the sod. So you want to make sure you're asking questions that you're getting uh, the reasons why they're making that, that um, and know that it's not correct. So when they're telling you how often to water and it seems really high, you may want to go ahead and question it or talk with someone else. Um, you can always uh, call your extension agent and just say, I've gotten this recommendation. What do you think? And your extension agent is going to be honest with you because we probably all have been um, through some kind of training um, or done lawn programs so that we would have an understanding of what might be a problem. So ask questions. All right. So uh, you can also have some issues with um, over irrigation, reclaimed water, which is uh, water that's coming from some other source uh, other than um, potable water. Uh, the thing is, is that if you are over irrigating, you can have detrimental effects with your lawn. And so even because this is zoysia, your zoysia lawn will end up not wanting all that water. They don't respond well to lots of water um, comparatively between the two of them. And so too much water can have a result like this. So you can see clearly the difference between the irrigation going on here and the irrigation going on for the house over here. And so they're having some serious issues with the fact that they're over irrigating and over irrigating with reclaimed water. So you're going to want to pay attention to whatever the reclaimed water talk is for more information. All right. So um, if you are coming from the north and you've been through any extension programs up there. So I used to do the, the tall fescue Kentucky bluegrass programs up there. You're used to a different bell curve. And so if you're thinking about this, you're looking at this. It tends to go more dormant in the summer, and then it's you're doing all your fertilization at the beginning of the growing period, but you have warm season turf because you've moved to Florida. And so your, your seasonal shoot and root growth of warm season grasses really relates to a lot of things. And so you'll know that during the summer months, and this has nothing to do with mowing height, it doesn't have anything to do with root length. It's just showing a co comparison of um, that growth, um, the seasonal shoot and root growth. So typically speaking, you're mowing your lawn a lot more. Um, if you, and I, I have the mowing stuff at the very end, I think, but essentially what it is, is that you are managing the irrigation of your lawn and the maintenance of your lawn is really going on during this growing season. And so you can water up to two times a week. Although if you are in town all the time, you can turn it off and turn it on when you do not have uh, sufficient water provided by rain. And then uh, if you're someone who's traveling, um, 
we'll talk about the rain sensors, but um, during your warm growing season, you can do up to two times a week, except for during that rainy season. Uh, and then we, as the, the half an inch to three quarters of an inch during the cooler seasons from maybe February to early spring and October, November ish um, on to that February time, you can water up to one time a week. Um, and during uh, December to February, our um, uh, Southwest Florida Water Management District recommends skipping a week from seven to 10 days. So you would irrigate every seven to 10 days. And obviously you're going to pay attention to the needs of your lawn. If you walk out into your lawn and your footprints stay, you know, you need to irrigate on your next available day, uh, but you do not need to water as often because the lawn is dormant. Uh, and so that some of this also relates to fertilization, but we won't talk about that now. The thing I don't want you to take from this is that you should scalp your lawn from, from November until, you know, March. That's not what this is saying. It's just showing you the comparison between the dormant period and the growing season. That's all this thing shows you. All right, so then the question is, how does an irrigation system work? Well, you know, you have a, you have a controller or sometimes people say a clock. Uh, but this controls your system. And so this particular one, this Hunter Pro C has six to nine zones in it. Uh, many of them may be in your lawn. Some of it could be landscape. And so the, the only thing I can say about landscapes is that they do not need, if they're established, they do not need to have as much irrigation as your lawn does. Uh, they have a different type of root system. They get established in a different way. And so after two to three years, you're looking at something being established and you can start paring down the water so that you are training them to not be watered as often and only watering when they need it, which is, you know, sometimes in the heat of summer. So then the other thing is, is that you may have those six to nine zones uh, and you also have valves and sprinklers of various types, which we've looked at just a little bit. And so when you are um, having this, this is set for certain times, many of you came in, it was already set. You may have had someone uh, visit to give you a tour of your irrigation system like they do uh, if they've been here less than a month up in the villages. And so you can get that tour and they talk about the system. And so what will happen is, is that you have a um, days set to water. You may have uh, the time that things start the program uh, start times and how things run. And then you're gonna end up having the opportunity to turn it off so you can take a look at specific zones. But essentially what this happens is, is that each zone has a valve. And what happens is, is that you have it scheduled in here for certain zones to turn on at certain times and run for a certain amount of time. Uh, and what will happen is, is those valves will open based on the schedule set in here and your ir irrigation sprinklers will go off for a set amount of time. And it usually it's a designated day. If you are in a, uh, a place with an HOA or uh, any of that, they usually regulate how often because sometimes the uh, soil and water conservation districts um, will say, you know, we recommend two days, up to two days a week. So anyway, this, the valves open, the sprinklers go off for that amount of time the valves close and it moves on to the next zone and the same thing starts all over again. Uh, and so you, you may already have it set for the two days a week that you need to have watered. And then you may have to make adjustments or turn your system off during the rainy season. But I do think you should know your zones. And so I have done visits for people that were really comfortable with their zones. And so they knew uh, how to turn on a zone. If I had a question, could you please turn this area on for me? Cause I want to find out why their lawn is dying. And sometimes you find out it's because of irrigation that that happens. Um, and so you should know your zones. You may have them on the inside of your controller box or your, your, um, in your garage, you have, you open it up and you can see what all your zones are. I have mine in my iPhone. So when I turn an irrigation system on, I'll walk out there and take a look and see if it's come on and if everything's working the way it should. So you want to make sure you know your zones and you have the ability to turn a zone on if you see that there's an issue so that you can check it. The other thing too, is that you have a rain sensor switch. You are legally responsible to have a rain sensor that is actually working 
in your landscape. It is a legal requirement. So you want to make sure that that's working. And obviously it saves you money to have it work. So your, um, how can you stop your irrigation using rain sensors? And so we have a lot of rain. I don't think we're supposed to have it today, but we have lots of rain uh, during the summer months. And so uh, inside this rain sensor, and this is a basic hunter, there are corks and you can have it set for various um, sensitivities in terms of your corks, but there are little cork rings inside here. And what happens is, is that these may last um, two, maybe three years in Florida. They're supposed to have five years, but we have a very different environment here. So it can have, take a little bit of beating on, on those corks. But what happens is those corks will swell up and there's a little switch down here. And so as these start to swell up, it will push that switch down, which will send the message to your uh, clock or your controller to turn your irrigation off. Uh, and so that's what will happen with that. You should inspect this yearly. So we have a lot of snowbirds where we are. And so usually when I do, I do a, a class called Florida Friendly Landscaping for New Residents. And I usually say, if you are a snowbird and you're going to leave, you need to make sure this thing works before you leave because there, you don't want to turn off your irrigation because what's going to happen is many of them will leave in May and won't come back until November. And we have drought that goes on between there. So you want to make sure this thing uh, actually works. So during the rainy season, your irrigation won't come on, but when you start getting into maybe late August, September, and October, uh, up until November, when things are really dry, the irrigation comes on as it is supposed to. Uh, and so I've had people who accidentally turned their water off in their house, which also affected the ability for their irrigation to run the way it was supposed to. So you have to make sure that you're considering all the, the thoughts before you travel um, out of town for an extended period, or whether you're a snowbird and you go up, make sure this thing is working and you don't want to turn everything off so that you don't have irrigation go off. I've had people call me and say, I realized I did not turn my irrigation on and uh, my lawn is dead. So take some time, make sure this is working. When you do the test, you uh, would sit out in your yard and you would spray um, and then um, you would spray this, have irrigation going on somewhere where you can see it. You would spray this until it shuts off. And that way, you know, it's still working. If it doesn't shut off, you need to have it checked or replaced. All right, and then there's soil moisture sensors. So there's um, actually, uh, Toro makes one. I saw this on top of the world where they were doing a um, uh, lawn installation over a soil addition that was supposed to make the, the lawn healthier. And so they, they installed these so they could do that sensor. There's other companies that make these. Um, and so you really wanna install these in the driest part of the yard because you want to make sure that it is uh, in a position to not be in a wet spot because then you'll think it's all it's, it's always think it's head rain so you want to make sure that it's it actually is um if you have enough rain this will also shut it off and so it looks like this so you've had enough rain uh it sends a signal up to your soil moisture sensor um controller which then breaks the um, the connection between this common line, which then goes down to the valve, which then re results in the valve not opening uh, and the water not going through. So you have the same sort of a situation as you do with your uh, rain sensor that you all may have on your roofs. So you don't want to mix heads in a zone. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, uh, if you have these two guys together, it may throw off the pressures and how well they irrigate, which can lead to more problems. And so uh, this would be a rotor, which may run 45 to 60 minutes, while this is a spray, which one's the 15 to 20 minutes, which we talked about earlier. So if you run this spray, as long as this has to run because it's on one zone, you're delivering three times as much water with the spray as you would with um, the rotor. And then and alternately, if you only run the rotor, as long as you run your spray 15 to 20 minutes, your lawn is going to let you know that by turning 
um, brown having dead patches. And so you want to make sure that you are not mixing these. I did visit someone this year, um, actually just recently that had both of these heads and there's a huge patch of dead in the lawn. So you want to make sure that you are um, uh, looking at this and don't let uh, the irrigation folks pop in something that does not relate to what you have in a particular zone. And sometimes they will do that. You also don't want to mix the nozzle type. So the sprays can do 1.7 inches per hour. Um, the rotators, which are really cool, those um, these are uh, really efficient at watering, but this, the rotator is 0.4 to 0.8 inches per hour and the rotors are 0.6 to 1.2. So you wanna make sure that you're not mixing those nozzles in the same zone. All right, so I, whenever I do programs on, on lawns, one of the main things I do a lot is tell people they need to check their irrigation system. So you should always inspect your system. If you suspect you're having problems, um, you should always consider perhaps it's just the irrigation system and I should check that first. So I always like to think that you should do that. While there's lots of other reasons why, I think the easiest thing to do is check your irrigation system first before you start moving on to those other things that I saw at the, that I put on my first slide up at the very beginning. So we talked about head-to-head -head coverage. So I'm taking that off. We're gonna skip through that. You wanna watch for blocked heads. And so usually in the presentation I give in Florida Friendly, I just show them this. And I say, well, what's going on here? And people will say, well, I think it looks like fungus or maybe it's bugs. What it is, is your, the irrigation is back here in the plants. And so this is a uh, slide that Jim Davis did with a little bit of video. Let's see if I can do this. And so it's blocking the area that's supposed to get to the lawn. And so if you are um, here, you could actually move the riser forward. You could lift the riser up. Um, but I think moving forward would probably be a great bet because that's in direct contact with the lawn. Your lawn should hopefully green back up again. It wouldn't have to be replaced. So it's just gone dormant, hopefully. And then moving that forward would get that to the point that it would green back up again. So you want to look for those blocked heads. You don't assume that it's automatically something. Cut your irrigation on and see if you can find the problem. And then the other thing you have is these irrigation heads um, when you, when plants are installed, they're very small. And so when you go to irrigate, you could actually have some problems with the fact that your, um, the water is not reaching all the plants it's supposed to. So it may be that you need to increase your risers, uh, the height of your risers. So it's hitting everything because you may find that on the backside of this, you may have some of those plants that are not doing as well because they're missing the water. Um, so it really depends. And so if you will go through and turn your irrigation system on, if you suspect that your plants are not doing as well, which is not lawn, but it is still something that um, can result in problems in your landscape. So you wanna make sure that you're taking care of those blocked heads. Uh, and if this is something you're comfortable with doing yourself, you may be able to increase the riser. So the other house that I visited, which I talked about, had the dual heads, also had switched from Zoysia to St. August, had switched from Zoysia, which is maintained at two to two and a half inches um, with St. Augustine, which is maintained at three and a half to four inches, but did not change their heads. So the heads would pop up and would spray across the turf top, which was not enough to irrigate their lawn efficiently. So you, that's another thing that you wanna make sure when you're doing that which doesn't relate to the slide, but wanted to add it. All right, so as you're walking around your lawn, perhaps the morning uh, with your cup of coffee or a nice hot tea, and you're looking out there at your lawn and you're thinking, oh gosh, what's going on? And so you may look at that and automatically think it's a bug. It may not be happening at the edge. It could be happening somewhere within your lawn. So it doesn't, while well, this picture shows this happening at the edge, um, right where the house is, um, and some landscape, there is a malfunctioning uh, spray in here. So you have spray heads that are not doing their job. Uh, and so if you don't walk through and look or turn your irrigation on, you may suspect something different. Um, so it's a really uh, important thing to take a look around and see what's going on. And when you turn your irrigation on, you may say, oh, 
I see exactly why that's not working. So the thing is, is that if you let this keep going and keep going, and keep going. What happens is you end up having weeds start show up in this part of the lawn because this part of the lawn may be dead eventually. Uh, and then you have more weeds and then you're trying to think, well, what's going on? Do I kill the weeds and my lawn will come back? It's a matter of starting with the irrigation first. Uh, and then after you get your irrigation running the way it's supposed to, then you can go through and manage all the other things that you need to also deal with. And some of those you can do together, but um, unless you are uh, properly irrigating um, and fixing that malfunctioning spray head, you're going to still have a problem. All right, so the orientation of spray also needs to be fixed because, for example, you can see that this one is going straight like this. And then if you're looking at this, eventually, if it were to completely miss that and this is getting nothing, you're going to start having some brown show up in this area. So this is what happens. And so I'm thinking this is probably Jim Davis doing this. All right, so um, fixing that, and, and you can see obviously also that at this area back here, um, there's not irrigation water that hits. And so hopefully it's getting enough water the way it is because of where the head is located, um, but he's got it fanned properly. So it's actually reaching out into the lawn the way it's supposed to. Uh, and you get to see the video again. <laughs> All right, so the other thing is geysers and say, um, when you're watering your lawn, the optimum time to water your lawn is 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. And the reason those are the optimum times to water your lawn is because your, um, the dew is falling between 2 and 7 a.m. So if you, if you go out during the early morning, you have to go somewhere, you walk out in, in the grass with your shoes, it's wet. It's not just because of that. Uh, it's because uh, the dew has fallen. Uh, because I go out there and my grass is wet every morning um, during these summer months. And so um, you may walk out there uh, and that's really when you want to water. So if you, if this zone is going off while you're still in bed and you're not inspecting your system, your water bill is going sky high because if you're watering two times a week or the three times a week that they're saying you should water when you're not supposed to, you're blowing through lots of water. And if you are on that one bill that really doesn't show you, you may look at that and go, well, gosh, I must've done a lot more laundry this week. But the people who have the bill where the irrigation is separate from the potable water of the house, you're looking at that and going, wow, irrigation really went up. Let's go see what's going on. And you start cutting your irrigation on in each one of your lawn areas and you would come across a geyser. And so this is so much more water going off. Some lawn, uh, lawn guy probably went over because you didn't have a donut in this spot and they took out the head. Uh, and so uh, that would go off every time that zone would open, that geyser would go off. And so you don't really wanna have any geysers um, on your property. So make sure you're doing your inspections. All right, so I have to tell you, I'm used to this picture right here. Uh, I went to a brief irrigation training uh, in Sarasota uh, some time ago, and I'd never seen one of these ever. So I didn't pay attention to how large the fingers were or any of this, but these things are, I will say, smaller than the size of my pinky around. Um, so what you can do with these, the clogged filters, is you can take these out and you can use your high pressure hose spray to get this algae off. And you may notice while these are actually in your landscape, um, if you have not caught it, you may have areas of brown uh, where they have not been properly irrigated. You may find that when the irrigation's on that this is just gurgling a little bit, not actually irrigating the way it's supposed to. So, so this may clog up, depending on how much of this is covered, the ability for water to come through the way it's supposed to. So you wanna do this. And this is more of a problem with any filter in reclaimed water versus um, the all water coming from one place, that potable water. And so uh, you go, you're gonna wanna do this and replace it. Sometimes landscapers will take them out. Uh, and in reclaimed water, you'll start going through your irrigation heads that way. So you wanna make sure that you're maintaining these. Um, you would just, you'd screw off the top, 
you would get this cleaned off, put it back in and screw everything back together again, and that will work. Um, and so all of them have filters. And so you may go through and check all the other filters as well that may be getting clogged up, especially if you have that reclaimed water. Um, sometimes heads have damage, which is another reason you may find them gurgling a little bit instead of spraying. Uh, I had a lady I visited that had three of them in a, in an area that were doing that. And so she had more weeds in that area than she had lawn. And then the other thing you want to look at is irrigating during the day. You want to not irrigate during the day because you're having more water going into uh, the atmosphere than you are actually watering your plants um, and things will evaporate faster. Um, but let's say this is not that. Let's say this is you're looking at this in the morning. So your, your valve can be adjusted um, to compensate for high pressure. And so sometimes these little spray nozzles will blow um, so much pressure out of them that they come out atomized like this instead of watering the way that they should. So when you turn your irrigation on, you may look and see if that's what's actually going on. So while I say don't irrigate during the day, and I do mean that because you may turn it on as you're checking it, but you're not going to go through and do the whole irrigation thing during the day. You just want to make sure that you are not having so much pressure. And if you're not a person who's comfortable working with your uh, the, the, thing, the things in your valve box, you may need to have someone just come in and make that adjustment for you um, if you have too much pressure. All right, so the other thing you don't wanna do is you don't wanna water your driveway or street because why should you have to pay money to water a hardscape? You need to do all you can to water just your, uh, your lawn areas and your landscape areas that really need to have that. So part of the reason this is happening in this particular picture is because someone keeps driving over the head. So make sure that you use donuts if you can do that. So you wanna make sure that if this is something that should only go to here, that's what you want. Perhaps there's a whole nother zone up here that does this, but someone actually hit this one. You can also make adjustments. So there's a key, um, this is a Hunter uh, PGP, but you have a key and the key can either one, reset ahead. And so I usually talk about people um, knowing what, seeing what the pattern is and shoving a pencil here, a pencil there, depending on where the, the pattern of spray is. So if you go through and make any kind of adjustments, um, you can actually reset your spray the way it's supposed to. So you're not changing the pattern. The other thing is, is that this key, I think if you flip it over, can regulate how far it sprays, whether it sprays farther or whether you rein it in to a certain area. So that can adjust. Um, and I'm thinking, I had someone say that you could get these at the, um, uh, one of the box stores, you can probably order these from Hunter or whatever irrigation system you have may have the same sort of a setup in terms of being able to make the adjustments for um, the spray, but also sometimes you don't even have to have the key to set the spray. So like you saw in that one picture, he just took his fingers and moved it. So sometimes you can just do that with even without a key, depending on what the head is. You want to look for leaks. And so the thing I would say one indication may be that you have so much water that's coming out of here that you end up having um, the sand come out from underneath. And so if you start seeing this, you immediately start looking for a leak. Uh, you also may find that you have these things in here which are not coming from irrigation because your irrigation spray is probably going to go like this. Um, it's not going to be irrigating back here, but when you have all this water start to show up, it may be that you have a leak in the, the head mechanism itself, the whole irrigation assembly, or it could be the pipe that's underneath. And so it's just a matter of uh, maybe digging down there to see what actually is the problem. So that way, when you have the guy come, you can say, well, I noticed that this is what the problem is. And so I think it's always good to have an idea um, of what you're asking for. You wanna make sure you have clean donuts. And so the lady that I visited, um, they had the, the uh, very large magnolia that was keeping her irrigation and causing um, brown in her yard. She, I couldn't find her donuts anywhere. She actually had donuts all over her yard and you couldn't find it because there was so much grass. And once grass roots in there, it's very hard to eliminate. So you wanna make sure that you are 
keeping your donuts nice and clean so that they will be able to pop up. And you also want to make sure that your irrigation head is actually below where the donut is. So when a guy comes through here with his lawnmower, his lawnmower is not buzzing off the top of your uh, irrigation head. So you want to have clean donuts so that if you have to change something or check something, you can actually see it or your head can pop up the way it's supposed to and irrigate the way it's supposed to. All right, so this is a problem. So this house right here irrigates this section with his front yard. And this house right here irrigates this section with his front yard. So what you have is two homes are irrigating this zoysia lawn, lots of water, um, up to two times a week. And zoysia does not like to be wet. And so this has um, gotten completely soaked. And so what it is, is that you can have a conversation with your neighbor about who irrigates which heads and what days. And so you can figure out how to solve this problem. Um, you can get approval to do some kind of landscaping issue and get rid of turf altogether. Um, but there's lots of possible solutions. But this is something that is a problem because both of these guys are so busy watering their lawns, which look fantastic maybe out front, but not so great next to them. So you need to watch for these sorts of things and look for solutions. All right, so there's some other considerations that you need to think about. You wanna watch for those heads that have been mowed over and scalped. You can see all these innards in here. So you don't have an actual complete head on the top of this. It may still work, it may not. Uh, but if it's been mowed over, the donuts are great things to have. And so you wanna make sure that you are having the ability to irrigate um, the way you should. And so sometimes having that below the donut is perfect. Like this one is, is uh, not working well and is leaning over, is filling up the donut with water. Um, and so you can have broken pipes and risers. It could be broken down inside here. So it's a matter of doing this inspection. And so making sure you go through your entire landscape and look for some of these. You may check the batteries in your clock. Um, sometimes it's really important to have those in there. So if you end up having any of that, um, uh, hurricanes come through, the power goes off suddenly and stays off for a couple of days for some whatever storm or whatever comes through, you wanna make sure that your batteries are in your, in your, um, your control, your time clock so that it is actually functional. Um, when the power comes back on. You want to make sure that works. Um, and I mentioned this before, but you want to make sure the irrigation uh, has not been turned on or water is turned off. When out of town, I had someone call me and said, I turned all my water off when I left to go and I'm not going to be back till November. A lot of times people will have folks who come by and see their house. So I had one guy who forgot to turn his irrigation on and killed his lawn. He had somebody who was babysitting would pop by and look at the house uh, and realize the lawn was dead. Then he turned the irrigation on to three days a week to water a dead lawn. So that's the other thing is you might wanna have some uh, things in place for when you travel. So, um, and usually for us it's palms as well, but. Uh, you want to make sure that people are watching out, um, have friends that are next door so they can help you with this. So make sure that when you go out of town, that you're not completely turning everything off uh, and you want to make sure rain sensor works so that when your irrigation is on, um, you will actually have the ability for it to be turned off with good rain. And then you may check wiring or corroded solenoids that you may have in your valve box. So sometimes it's not always the irrigation itself you may find the whole zone doesn't come on because something's going on inside your valve box, which uh, is the, the place where you have the valve open and close that lets the water go through to your zone. So you wanna make sure that that is also not the issue. And so a lot of folks would probably, I would be, um, me personally would be wary of messing with that, um, anything in there. And I probably would call someone to do that for me to make sure everything is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but there are several things that you can check. Um, and so there's that. Now, watering efficiently. So this is one of those nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping that I think is so important. 
Um, the reason that we talked about doing some of the practices that we do, watering half an inch to three quarters of an inch up to two times a week, making sure you water when your lawn needs it, not just because uh, you can. So it's sometimes people just like to set it and forget it, but water is such a, um, a finite resource here that, and uh, fragile that you want to make sure that you are protecting it, especially um, if you are a new resident coming from another state and you're moving to a state that does have that, uh, that instance, you want to make sure that you're protecting it. But the reason we do this is because we want to promote deep roots. Uh, and so I've got one thing after this, I think that I will talk about, but you want those deep roots to happen in, uh, in your lawn. You want deep roots. Uh, you get deep roots by uh, irrigating no more than two times a week, half an inch to three quarters of an inch per of water by skipping a week from February to December, only watering seven to 10 days apart, um, reducing to one day a week when the temperatures get cool. All that helps to make your lawn more resilient and form those deeper roots, which is what you really want to have for a successful lawn. Uh, and that watering efficiently reduces pests and diseases. So this, this is Entomosporium leaf spot on Indian hawthorn. Um, this is also exacerbated by the fact that the leaves will fall off and part of the disease is up underneath the plant on those leaves that have fallen. So you're going to want to make sure you clean those up, but also consider whether you're overwatering in this area. And then you know you're overwatering when dollar weed shows up because this will grow in water by itself. It does not need to have somebody's really wet lawn, but it will show up in someone's really wet lawn. So if you see this showing up in your turf, you're overwatering. Um, and the thing that's really good about reducing pests and diseases, so um, uh, it, it reduces thatch. And so some of those pests love to have thatch. And so uh, between over fertilizing with nitrogen, uh, and over watering, you can increase your thatch layer and be sure to have tropical sob wetworm, um, other sorts of pests that like to live in thatch and eat your turf. So in addition to watering efficiently, you do it because it helps to reduce pest diseases and it can also reduce your thatch. You water from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. because that's when dew falls. And I think this is my last slide. So if you are mowing at the right height you and you're not taking any more than a third of the blade off at a time you will maintain those roots you grew um, took so much time growing efficiently watering correctly all of that you only take a third of the blade off at a time if you take off more there's a direct relationship between how much you take off and how many roots you have so um, you want to make sure that you are um, not taking more than a third of the blade off. If you have empire zoysia, um, you want to uh, mow between two to two and a half inches. Uh, and so if you let it get a little higher, you can take it back to this range, but you don't want to take more than a third of the blade off. If you have St. Augustine, Floritam, and there's other cultivars, other, there's some that are of both of these that are maintained lower. You need to know what your cultivar requirements are. Um, you may have 3.5 to four inches. And so generally St. Augustine is gonna be this, three and a half to four. If you have Bahia like me, it's three and a half to four. So I have a great uh, group that comes to mow my lawn. I may start like this, I end up like this. So you wanna make sure that you're doing things correctly. So this is me, and this is what you want your lawn to look like. Nice and pretty and green. If you end up having any questions, um, you want to give me a call. This is my main office number. And here is my email in case you need to get up with me for something. Uh, and then I want to say July 22nd, this might be, Lynn would say this, July 22nd uh, next week is going to be reclaimed water do's and don'ts. And so this is so important if you're managing reclaimed water, because you saw that one picture with the guy over water with it and his lawn was ugly compared to his neighbors. So you want to, you want to know what to do with this. And so anyway, does anybody have any questions? And these are the people I say, thank you to. 
Thank you so much, Miss Lisa. That was very informative. So we only have five minutes left. We'll take a few questions. Um, please use the Q&A function and submit your questions here. I saw right. one I saw one question asked. Uh, the speaker mentioned, she, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sitting oh. here reading it. Speaker mentioned she uses an app-based irrigation controller. Can she speak generally about the advantage of some such devices? I think it's a nice thing to have that app. Um, and the, and I, I will tell you, I don't, I don't use it. I don't have irrigation. I'm lucky when my lawn is green. Um, but I will say that the apps are great things because if you're not in town, and you're realizing that you're going to be getting pummeled with rain, you could turn your irrigation system off with using your app. So I think that apps are really great things you can use. And I don't, you may want to um, add something uh, something else, you land if there's something else you want to add about it. But to me, this is one of those great options for where technology is these days, because you're going to be um, having that option to control your irrigation from somewhere else. And so even if you're traveling, you still have the ability to do a little bit of control. Anything else you wanna add about that? Hey, not particularly, you covered a lot. I'm searching an EDS pub, a fact sheet about smart irrigation, a smart controller, like uh, these uh, you can control from Wi-Fi or control from Wi-Fi is not technically qualified as a smart controller, but something it's uh, based on evapotranspiration, like really smart to know how much water it's need. So those can, it has a learning curve, but once you get a hang of that, it can, it can save you water and uh, become very easy to operate. So I'm searching that publication. I will put in the chat box. Um, and we have another question here, Miss Lisa. So um, they are a great op. They are great option, but important that you still have a ring sensor, as the weather station don't always have the same conditions as uh, as your home. So. I assume that's the comment related to the smart controller because mm -hmm. uh, some, some smart controllers are based on the weather station data. And, and yet, some, go ahead. I, I agree with that entirely. So um, the other thing I would say is that uh, sometimes if you are still there, I'd like to go back to that old fashioned um, rain gauge because sometimes it's nice to know that you've had, if you, especially if you've turned your system off, it's nice to know how much rain you've received in that week. And that is so low tech um, because people are still use that in our garden. But anyway, so um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Yelin. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, you are fine. I just post the link, the smart controllers in the chat box. If you want to learn more, that's where, uh, and where you can find more information. We have two minutes left, but I will use the power of facilitator and ask Miss Lisa a question. So we, like from your pictures, uh, we saw so many mistakes uh, related to spring, uh, sprinkler head, like the mixed uh, heads or even blocked heads. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something homeowners they can do themselves or there are higher landscaper? I think that there are some people who are really comfortable with doing that sort of thing. And so I actually have met with people that kind of do their own thing. And as long as the homeowner is comfortable with um, being able to make those repairs, I don't see a problem with that. But if you're not someone uh, that would be comfortable doing that, I would say certainly hire somebody. But I also think that it's good to look at your system, um, run your system, know where your problems are. If you think you have a leak somewhere, you could go through and just carefully excavate. So you actually are the informed person when you're calling your irrigation guy, because sometimes they may just say, well, I found this and I found that. If depending on who you're working with, and you really want to be able to say, I have a leak right here and um, I need to have that repaired. And so I don't like to have people say, well, can you check and see what's going on? My irrigation doesn't seem to be functioning. I love to have people who go in and say, this is the problem I'm having. Is there a way you could check this head for me? Okay. Right. Be an informed homeowner. I like exactly. it. Exactly. And you get that the last class. So the, the kinds of co communication you can have. So I think that'll be really good. Yes, thank you. That's actually a good way to finish today's uh, today's webinar. So Miss Lisa, if you can go back to the last slide and show them all the topics. 
Um, okay, let me go back. I'm going to close this really quick because I had the questions in there. I'm going to go here and I just hit backspace, backspace. Okay. Thank you. And we, we did receive some comments. It's a said it's a great presentation. I totally agree. And I posted in the chat box, it's the link to the blog. Actually, it's just like this table show you all the topics. So each topic has a different link. You can register all the topics or you can just register the topics you are interested. If you cannot attend, I still suggest you register because all the registrants will receive handouts and the recordings, uh, links to the recordings. So here is all the upcoming topics topics. And as Miss Lisa said, next week is reclaim water do's and the don'ts. So we look forward to seeing you next uh, Thursday. So with that, thank you, Miss Lisa again. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. See you next Thursday. Bye. Bye.